This talk was presented on the first Sunday of Advent 2016. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist who spent several years imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. He experienced firsthand what it means to exist as a human being under the most extreme circumstances. He described what he learned in a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning, which has sold 12 million copies. One of the things Frankl discovered is that hope is literally a matter of life and death. I would like to read a few lines from Frankl's discussion about hope. The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis, the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. We all feared this moment, not for ourselves, which would have been pointless, but for our friends. It usually began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed and wash or to go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to the sick bay or to do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. Repeating the first sentence of this quote, the prisoner who had lost faith in the future his future was doomed. Believing that life will be better for us was not enough to keep an inmate alive. Instead, what kept a prisoner alive was the belief that life will be better for me. Frankel describes the relationship between dying and lack of hope. The death rate in the week between Christmas 1944 and New Year's 1945 increased beyond all previous experience. The explanation for this increase did not lie in the harder working conditions or the deterioration of our food supplies or the change of weather or new epidemics. It was simply that the majority of the prisoners had lived in the naive hope that they would be home again by Christmas. As the time drew near and there was no encouraging news, the prisoners lost courage and disappointment overcame them. This had a dangerous influence on their powers of resistance, and a great number of them died. Any attempt to restore a man's inner strength had first to succeed in showing him some future goal. In other words, Frankel discovered that there is a principle of positive thinking. Mental well-being does affect physical health. Prisoners who lost hope became susceptible to physical illness and died. But Frankel also found that naive hope is deadly. If hope is to keep a person alive, then it must be based in something solid that cannot be shaken. Many of the prisoners had practiced positive thinking by hoping that they would be home again by Christmas. But when Christmas came and went and nothing changed, then prisoners lost hope and died. Summarizing, hope is needed to keep a person alive. But this must be a personal hope that my future will improve. And it must also be a solid hope that cannot be shattered by changing circumstances. The Apostle Peter describes these same two features when talking about hope in First Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter describes the personal nature of hope. It is an inheritance that is reserved in heaven for you. Peter also emphasizes that this hope is solid. It is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. And Peter implies that this hope keeps a person alive, protected by the power of God 
through faith for salvation ready to be revealed. But Peter adds something which Frankel does not explicitly mention. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A hope that is based in this physical world is not enough because such a hope can always be shattered by disappointment, missed opportunities, injustice, persecution, war, illness, old age, or death. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Before continuing, let us summarize what we have learned so far. Hope keeps a person alive, literally. Hope that is not built on a solid foundation is also deadly, because disappointment can kill, literally. Hope that is limited to the physical realm is not enough, because it can always lead to disappointment. Therefore, one must become born again to a living hope. Think about this phrase, born again to a living hope. Hope is not something that one tries to drum up through self-effort or tries to instill by repeating slogans. Instead, hope is something that emerges within as a byproduct of becoming personally reborn. And the hope that emerges is a living hope. Saying this more personally, I am not trying to add the character trait of hope to my personality. Instead, hope lives independently within my mind, and this living hope keeps me going. Hope is not normally viewed as something that is acquired at the end of a process of personal rebirth. Instead, hope is usually seen as something that one follows at the beginning. For example, hope is the topic of the first Sunday of Advent. This kind of easy or naive hope can motivate a person for a while, but it is not a solid hope. For instance, I hope that I will win the lottery. I hope that church politics will go away. I hope that President Trump will solve America's problems. Or I hope that the Chicago Cubs will win the World Series. Romans 5 describes the process of building a lasting hope. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Let us look at this process more closely. Exult is not a word that one normally uses in English. The original Greek term means to hold one's head up high because one has the right base of operation to deal successfully with a matter. For instance, a medical doctor can exult when walking into a room to examine a patient because of having the medical knowledge and experience that is required to deal successfully with illness or injury. Hope is mentioned both at the beginning and the end of this sequence. One starts by finding peace with God through Jesus Christ, and one becomes introduced into a life of faith in which one holds one's head up high because of hope in God. But that is only the beginning. If one wants a hope that does not disappoint, then one must become reborn to a living hope, and that means going through a testing process. This process begins with tribulation. One normally equates tribulation with persecution and suffering. But the original Greek word is thalipsis, which is used of a narrow place that hems someone in, especially internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined. Being squeezed leads to perseverance, which literally means remaining under. Perseverance 
is followed by proven character. And that is finally followed by hope. But notice the type of hope that emerges at the end. It is a solid hope. In the language of Paul, it does not disappoint. And it is also a living hope because it is backed up by the love of God through the Holy Spirit. Before we continue, let us review again what we have learned so far. Hope is needed to stay alive. But one must be very careful to pursue hope that is solid, because losing hope can also be deadly. Solid hope does not emerge instantly. Instead, it forms at the end of a process of being squeezed, sticking with it, and having one's character tested. And when solid hope emerges, it acquires a life of its own, backed up by the love of God and the Holy Spirit. Using a local analogy, solid hope is somewhat like the mushrooms that grow outside on the church lawn, because they continue emerging from the depths and they keep reappearing no matter what one does. Romans 8 describes another key attribute of hope. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. The word translated perseverance is the same one Paul uses in Romans 5, which means remaining under or sticking with. For instance, many shiny new gadgets were on sale this weekend during Black Friday. But that is not an example of hope, because the focus was upon acquiring visible objects. Black Friday also is not an example of perseverance, because most shoppers were not waiting eagerly, but rather grabbing impatiently. In contrast, Frankel and his fellow prisoners in the Nazi concentration camp had nothing physical to look forward to except pain, hardship, and death. Therefore, they had no choice but to turn inwards for hope, looking to the unseen. That brings us to our final question. How can one find solid hope in the unseen? Is it even possible to build hope? in today's consumer society. After all, physical is usually equated with solid. This podium, for instance, is solid because I can see it and touch it. And in today's consumer society, the physical world is filled with attractive, desirable, solid objects that can take the place of hope. We don't have the time to answer this question fully but I would like to finish by mentioning one key principle as one as one major obstacle. The principle can be found in the passage in 1 Peter 3 that was read earlier in the service. Hope is mentioned in the middle of this passage. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Peter describes two aspects to hope. There is a living side to hope that affects the heart. Sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Something implanted by God is living inside that needs to be protected and followed. But there is also an intellectual side to hope that involves the head. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope. The word translated defense is the word apologia, from which we get the term apologetics, and it describes the type of reasoned legal defense that one gives in a court of law. Similarly, the word account refers to a verbal statement. This is a strange juxtaposition, Peter isn't telling us to use apologetics to defend theology or to prove the existence of God. He is also not saying that one should attempt to support hope by stirring up the emotions. Instead, 
Peter says that one should use verbal, logical reasoning to support hope. This is a key principle because logical reasoning will build something solid in the unseen. Notice exactly what Peter is saying. He doesn't say, give a rational explanation for the idea of hope. Instead, he says, always be ready to give a rational explanation for the hope that is in you. Let us turn now to the major obstacle. This obstacle can be found in many places, but it can be illustrated by a biblical passage that was read in church two weeks ago. One of the readings from that service quoted 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 and 10. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human, well, what is the rest of the passage? The NIV continues, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. This passage is talking about hope because it describes something unseen that God has prepared for those who love him. The NIV uses the word mind, and that is the word that we read two weeks ago, but that is not an accurate translation. Instead, the original Greek word is cardia, which means heart, from which we get the word cardiology. Both the New American Standard and the King James translate this verse accurately. Quoting from the King James, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Summarizing, hope does not come from what one sees or hears. Hope will eventually be expressed in the scene, and it can be defended using words, but it is not based in what one sees and hears. Instead, hope is something internal. What type of internal thing is hope? It is a combination of heart and mind. It is a living hope that one can defend using rational thought. But which of these two is the starting point, heart or mind? The NIV gives the impression that the mind cannot be trusted. But that is a mistranslation, because the original Greek says that the deepest problem lies with the heart. Similarly, Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Going the other way, Romans 12 says that we are transformed by the renewing of the mind. This is a rather important distinction when one is in the middle of a situation that requires solid hope. Because I suggest that hope that does not have a reason will not survive. If one wants a solid hope that will survive when things get tough, then I suggest that one must ultimately build hope upon the mind and not upon the heart. I would like to finish with a personal example. I experienced a period of time in the 1980s when the path of following God was especially lonely and I could not see any results. I would wake up every morning and feel that I had no reason to live. I would then use rational thought to think about my alternatives. I could give up and turn into a cynic. I could focus upon short-term needs and forget about building for the long term. I could pursue a normal career like most others around me. But I knew that each of these options would damage me and stop me from growing. I could not see where I was going. There was nothing visible to guide me. But I knew, based in rational thought, that I did not want to follow any of the alternatives. Therefore, I would conclude by saying something like, I choose to follow a path that might lead to life rather than choose to follow paths that I know will lead ultimately to mental and spiritual dead ends. I would then find that hope would rise up from somewhere deep inside, and I would have enough hope to keep going for another day. This reasoning process happened day after day, 
month after month. Putting this all together, hope that comes from God is solid because the character of God does not change. The eternal character of God is revealed through how the natural world works, how the mind works, how the spiritual realm works, and how God treats us as we walk through life. But it is possible to ignore the character of God and rebel from the ways of God for a while. However, if one stops rebelling and submits to the squeezing of God's ways, if one remains under the hand of God, and if one survives testing, then one will discover that God's eternal, unchanging character provides the foundation for a living hope that is more solid than anything that one sees with one's eyes, hears with one's ears, or feels with one's heart. This hope will live inside and cause a person to exult even when walking in a direction that is different than the path of society. Others will see that one is marching to a different drummer and they will want to know why. And one will be able to give a reasoned defense because one's hope is based in an understanding of the character of God and an understanding of how God has made things work. And because one is submitting to how things work, rather than trying to stir up hope, one will give this defense to others in an attitude of gentleness and reverence.